Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a very great pleasure to be here and to try to outline some of the pharmacological issues uh, around integrase inhibitors. And we'll also talk about some of the new delivery systems. So this is the first picture of the city which I come from. But actually, the place where I spend most of my time is, uh, is here, which is a stadium for Liverpool soccer team, or Little Brazil, because we have some fantastic Brazilian players. And uh, they give me great excitement to watch the Brazilian players, Firmino, uh, Fabinho, and now the goalkeeper, Alisson, as well. So we have some great players playing for, for Liverpool. So thank you very much for sending some uh, excellent, uh, excellent players. So here are some disclosures. And the topics that I want to try to cover are the changing face of treatment, oral nanoformulations of antiretrovirals, intramuscular long-acting nanoformulations of antiretrovirals, and long-acting implants of antiretrovirals. I think it's important for us to know where the field is moving. And so number one is the changing face of treatment. And I'm sure we're all aware that it's, as we look at treatment, over the years it's been such exciting developments of where we've uh, come from and where we're going. So we started out, of course, with uh, just single drugs, zidovudin monotherapy, went to triple drug therapy, went through uh, single tablet regimens through the integrase era. And now in 2018, we're looking at what is going to be the future. And we've already discussed some aspects of two drug regimens, and Omar will discuss more about that this afternoon. And I want to discuss some of the new delivery systems that we have to have in our thinking, certainly for the upcoming years. So we've already looked at guidelines, and if you summarize the major um, world guidelines of the USDHHS, the ISUSA, the World Health Organization, and the European AIDS Clinical Society, clearly what you have is that the integrase inhibitors are pivotal to all of the guidelines for first-line antiretroviral treatment options. We've had 30 antiretrovirals since the beginning. And now if you come down in the preferred options and first level, we're dealing with 12 antiretrovirals of the 30 that we've had generated. So the protease inhibitor in two of the guidelines, Darunavir, the four integrase inhibitors, two NNRTIs appear in two of the guidelines, and then the five nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So we've come from 30 down to these 12 drugs in first-line treatment. For the integrase inhibitors, they're a class which are vitally important. We've seen that already this morning. And they differ in a number of ways. Clearly, they differ in the dose which is used. And we can see for raltegravir, the dose of BID or once daily. For elvitegravir, boosted. For dolutegravir, 50 milligrams. For bictegravir, 50 milligrams. So a different amount of drug for the treatment for, for one dose. The way that the body handles the drugs are different as well. In that raltegravir is exclusively handled by an enzyme UGT1A1. This is the bilirubin enzyme. This is the, this is the enzyme that metabolizes bilirubin. You also then have the combination of cytochrome P453A and UGT1A1 for bictegravir, and that's about 50-50. So the two enzymes are important. For elvitegravir, it's exclusively CYP3A, which means you need it to be boosted in order to have enough drug in the blood system. And for dolutegravir, it's mainly UGT1A1, about 10 to 15% of the uh, cytochrome P450. So there's a difference between each of the drugs, and that plays out for the drug interaction potential. That with UGT1A1, raltegavir is the least in terms of DDI potential. 
just, uh, just a, a little bit less than for Dolly Tegravir and also for Bic Tegravir. And then we have Elvi Tegravir, which is the highest. Now, is there evidence for that statement? Well, yes, there is. Because the Liverpool database, which we run from our unit in Liverpool for drug interactions, has these colors for co-medications of green or the orange-yellow color and the red. And if you look at each of those drugs, then Raltegravir has 95% of all the co-meds in the database, more than 700 are green, so no concern of a drug interaction. For the Dolutegravir, it's 93%. For Bictegravir, it's 86%. And for Elvitegravir, Cobicistat, it's only 53%. So we can see the difference in the number of drugs that we have to think about for drug interactions when we're managing patients. <coughs> Very few for Raltegravir and Dolutegravir, a few more for Bictegravir, and a lot more for Cabotegravir. So that is important for us. And one of the interactions which Ian already mentioned this morning, which is clearly very important, is the interaction that integrase inhibitors, all of the integrase inhibitors have with metal cations. Because of the mechanism of action with the magnesium at the heart of the integrase enzyme, then the integrase inhibitor binds to the magnesium, but it also can bind to aluminium, to calcium, and to other cations. Which means that when you look at the label, you find that there are statements for all of the integrase inhibitors. So for raltegravir, aluminium and magnesium are not recommended to be given with raltegravir. For dolutegravir, it's separate by two hours or six hours. For elvitegravir, separate by at least four hours. For bictegravir, take under fasting conditions two hours before. So actually the labels can be a little bit confused because there are the differences in the label about the timing. The important thing is to separate your cation from the integrase inhibitor. Calcium becomes even more confusing in many ways because the statements around calcium for raltegravir is no dose adjustment for BD, not recommended for QD. For dolutegravir, it's the same statement as for magnesium aluminium antacids. For elvitegravir, there's no statement in the label. And for bictegravir, slightly different about the food aspect and the timing. So I think we do need some clarification, and particularly around calcium, because calcium can have a whole range of the amount of calcium. Now, if in Brazil, patients take their drugs often with milk, then you have in a glass of normal milk about 300 milligrams of calcium. The study that we have with dolutegravir was done with 1,200 milligrams of calcium. The study performed with raltegravir was done with 3,000 milligrams of calcium. And different calcium preparations are very different in the content of calcium. What I think we do not know is where the threshold for an effect of calcium is to lower the exposure of dolutegravir and the timing of when you take it. And we do need some better studies to help inform this important, simple aspect of taking calcium supplements, calcium antacids, calcium-containing foodstuffs with our uh, dolutegravir. So I think that is important. There are other important drug interactions for integrase inhibitors around metformin, because at least two or three of the integrase inhibitors can interfere with metformin and increases exposure. Metformin is renally excreted. And then with strong enzyme inducers, which we've already mentioned as far as some of the studies are concerned, rifampicin and rifabutin and other strong enzyme inducing agents, which can lower the exposure of the, the different integrase inhibitors. And we haven't got time to go into all of the different studies, but there are differences clearly between the integrase inhibitors, which we can discuss. 
Interestingly, in our database, we're able to search for everything that is being looked at. So in Brazil, the commonest co-medication that is searched for in the Liverpool app or the Liverpool database is actually omeprazole, followed by valproate, and then followed by some of the other anti-epileptics, which is very interesting. And if you look for dolutegravir, the red flag that we have is for phenytoin, which is contraindicated, not co you can't co-administer. Interestingly, for valproate, it's an orange flag, but we don't know the mechanism of that interaction. It comes from one series of case reports where the exposure of dolutegravir was very low in patients who were on valproate. Uh, it was reduced by over 70% causing some concern, but there are other reports which suggest that this may not be such a big problem. So we really are a little bit unsure about the whole valproate dolutegravir potential interaction. So it's interesting to see what you're looking for in Brazil as far as interactions with dolutegravir. And then going forward, I'm just going to mention two drugs which are on the newer antiretrovirals. Clearly, we've had Duravarine uh, approved recently, uh, Ibaluzumab, which is a monoclonal antibody, Bictegravir, but Cabotegravir, and also the MK8591 for long-acting preparations. This is Ibaluzumab. It's an interesting drug because it is, in a sense, quite long-acting. It's given intravenously, and the maintenance dose is given every two weeks of this drug for highly treatment experienced patients. So what about oral nanoformulations of antiretrovirals? What do we mean by a nanoformulation and why is there interest in nanoformulations? Well, there's a lot of interest, certainly between academics, agencies, and pharmaceutical companies to improve the drugs that we have. And one way is potentially to use nanomedicine, which is very small particles of the drug, in better formulations for the treatment of HIV. This paper was just released last week on the potential value of nanoformulations coming from our group in Liverpool. But just look at this. This is how you can deliver what is often a poorly water-soluble drug. So the hand is now shaking a normal antiretroviral, very poorly water-soluble. But you can make a nano-formulation of the same drug in order to improve its solubility, and the drug is now readily dissolved. And that might have implications. We talked about pediatrics before. So pediatric chalitra at the present time each one mil of pediatric chalitra contains 42% of alcohol, which makes it clearly a, not a particularly nice tasting drug to take. But for a nano formulation, we believe that we can produce much better water soluble drugs. And for pediatrics, this might have uh, extreme benefit going forward. Also, different oral drug delivery systems. This might look complex and really rather far-fetched. But this is simply a capsule which can be taken and once the capsule is swallowed and goes into the stomach, it opens up into six different arms. So the capsule breaks open and the six arms that you can see here each have different drugs. And the studies so far have been done with cabotegravir, dolutegravir and ropivirine in order to get a longer acting oral formulation. So it's simply taking a capsule which might give you a once a week formulation of the drug in order to have benefit in that way. It's early days, the studies are only being done at the present time preclinically, but going forward there will be clinical data emerging. What about the intramuscular long-acting nanoformulations, which we've already mentioned from the LATTE 2 studies? A definition of long-acting is a drug with a prolonged effect because of a formulation resulting in the slow release of the active principle 
or the continued absorption of small amounts of the, the drug over an extended time. So this is a long-acting definition, and we need that in order to understand what we're talking uh, about for these uh, preparations. People say, what is the attraction? And we touched on this this morning, potentially more infrequent dosing, lower overall drug dose, preventing poor adherence. But would you give it to a patient who was poorly adherent? Would they come back once a month or every two months for their injection? So I think there's a question about that. In patients with pill fatigue, directly observed therapy, and maybe overcoming some of the treatment-related stigma. So there are certain advantages, and there's a lot of interest. You just search nanoformulations of antiretrovirals, long-acting, many, many papers, many preparations. This is Rilpivirine, this is Dolutegravir, this is uh, Maravaroc. So there's a lot of uh, discussion around the long-acting field. And the two drugs which are most commonly discussed are cabotegravir and rilpivirine. They're matched for their pharmacology. That's important. The oral half-life of cabotegravir is 40 hours, of rilpivirine is 50 hours, but the long-acting half-life, 20 to 40 days and 30 to 90 days. So these drugs are matched as far as their properties are concerned to make them not only um, good for oral delivery, but also for long-acting delivery. And we've seen some of the LATTE2 data this morning. The pharmacology is that you want to try to get the drug exposure, the drug levels, similar from an intramuscular dose as to what you would get from an oral therapy. And this has been done, and the oral therapy for the rupivirine and for the cabotegravir, this is cabotegravir, the black line is the medium, median oral concentration, and from the intramuscular, you get very close to that, and for cabotegravir, similarly. So you're trying to achieve similar drug levels from a single intramuscular dose to what you would get from the oral therapy. And we saw this data this morning from the four-week and the eight-week LATTE2 data. I think what's important to note is that the no virologic data, which is down here, there were more um, dropouts or more discontinuations for the four-week than there was for the eight-week. But overall, compared to the oral, then the below 50 was extremely positive for both the um, one monthly and two monthly regimens. And then people were asked about whether they wanted to, uh, to take these, did they prefer patient reported outcomes? And the patient reported outcomes were, were certainly advantageous towards the eight weekly versus slightly better than the four weekly, but very much better than the oral. So I think from the patient's perspective, maybe even more than the physician's perspective, there are advantages of the long acting. And there was one subject in LATTE2 with a protocol uh, defined virologic failure, and it did seem in this particular patient, compared to the mean drug exposure, the green line shows the lower concentrations um, for this case uh, of the cabotegravir and also for the rilpivirine. So there was slightly lower exposure, which gives us a hint that if you have too little drug, then you're not going to achieve your virological uh, endpoint. This has gone forward, and the announcement just a, a, a month or so ago from Viv uh, of the results of the first 48-week phase three trial, the ATLAS trial, which was for the one monthly. So we've gone from phase 2B through to phase three, and the data is certainly uh, very positive from the 48-week um, data for ATLAS. So we're going forward with this two-week intramuscular uh, data. So some of the key issues, of course, is, is rilpivirine a really good drug to put with cabotegravir? And will this be a rollout drug in the future for intramuscular? Which drugs can we combine? What is the injection volume? Are we concerned about the injection volume? 
what to do about the missed doses, the long-term low drug levels at the end of a dosing interval. If somebody doesn't turn up for their injection, they've got low drug levels during that period. And management of adverse events, it's non-reversible when the drug is there. Uh, and what about drug-drug interactions? Will they be different compared to oral drug-drug interactions? So there's a lot of things that we have to work out. This is a study which our team was performing in conjunction with Ian McGowan in Pittsburgh. And what we had were healthy volunteers who were in one trial of ropivirine who then rolled over after a year or so to another trial containing ropivirine. And in those subjects who started the second trial, they had residual levels of ropivirine from over a year ago and actually down to over two years from one single intramuscular injection, two years afterwards, there was still some residual um, real pivoting. And this is the time, so these are days, so this is one year down to two years, and the concentrations of real pivoting that you could still see in those subjects when they enrolled into the next trial is something that we have to think about. Because the target concentration for efficacy for ropivirine is 12 nanograms, these patients had, these subjects had just below that. And so that's something of, of a concern for missed dosing. And also in a study that we did, this was selection of NNRTI resistance. This was a healthy volunteer given a low dose in a PrEP trial of ropivirine and the drug Sorry, and the drug exposure in the, 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 the subject is the blue line. And about this point, when the drug exposure was at a critical level of the protein adjusted IC90, this healthy volunteer had an exposure to a new sexual partner who was HIV positive. And you can see the viral load which increased in, the, in this subject, got infected, but also there was evidence of the uh, appearance of a mutation, the K101E. And so that subject who was on a PrEP trial, healthy volunteer, became infected with the emergence of a K101E mutation. So again, we have to be aware of some of the issues around these trials. And we have to work out how do we do drug interactions with long acting. Uh, and this is an example of cabotecavir and ropivirine where we're using methodology of in silico uh, drug interaction um, uh, monitoring. Uh, and this is a method of what's called physiological based PK. Rather than doing the trial, you do the modeling for the, the, for the study. And this is modeling data for cabotegavir and ropivirine. Now, interestingly, of course, if we go down the road of these long-acting preparations, the amount of drug that a patient is going to take is going to be very much less. If somebody at the moment takes dolutegavir, abacavir, 3TC, then they have 346 grams of drug per year, which over 50 years, if they take the drug for 50 years, it's equivalent to 17 kilograms of Brazilian sugar. Okay, so you take 17 kilograms of drug. On the other hand, if you take cabotegavir and ropivirine intramuscularly, the amount of drug that you will take is six grams a year, and over 50 years of lifetime, only a quarter of a bag of Brazilian sugar. So it's a lot less drug if you actually, that the body is gonna have over a lifetime if we go down that road. Finally, just in my last minute and a bit, long-acting implants. This is an exciting area. Implants are not new. Contraceptive implants are common. This is just two countries, Chad and the Democratic Congo, and you can see many women have implants of contraceptive. So this isn't new, but we're now taking it forward and thinking about implants of antiretrovirals. Long-acting implants, different devices. This little device here is about three centimeters long for taking the antiretroviral under the skin. This one looks horrible. Um, it's more of a device which is being pioneered for um, implants of TAF. There are potential advantages. 
and potential disadvantages of having an implant for an antiretroviral. And these have to be discussed. The drug that really is being uh, focused on uh, a lot is not an integrase inhibitor. It's the NRTTI MK8591. It's a nucleoside reverse transcription translocation inhibitor. Very potent. It's got a long half-life. The early data given orally showed that a log drop of over 1.6 with a single dose of 10 milligrams, and you watch the log drop, but actually even lower than that, 0.5 milligrams oral single dose gives a drop of nearly two logs. So it's a really potent new drug, NRTTI. And going forward, this is being discussed and a lot of preclinical data with an implant of the MK8591. And these are data in the rat and in the non-human primate. And these data, just published just a few weeks ago, showing the duration of the, the way that the implant lasts for the drug concentration. This is the MK8591. This is the intracellular triphosphate over days after an implant of the MK8591. Now you might say, well, this doesn't interest us in Brazil. This is, you know, we're in, in the Dolly Tegavir era. But this is the way the field is moving. And I think we least have to be aware of what could happen within the next five years for the kind of different modalities for drugs. And the final one is to show this which is micro needles of microarray patches. So these are patches which can be put on the arm. So you can see here it's a patch. But in the patch, there are these little tiny needles. And from the patch, the drug goes into under the, um, under the skin. And from that, you can have a long-acting drug. So from this transdermal patch. So this is, again, being discussed. And we have data presently um, which we're working on for cabotegavir and rupivirine. And there's a lot of modeling of how this could look for the future. So I think we do have a lot of exciting way forward for long acting. Also for tuberculosis, for hep C, for hep B, maybe for malaria. This is the way that a lot of uh, discussion and a lot of studies are going. And I hope that uh, in the future we'll have more to discuss from a clinical perspective of this exciting field. Thank you very much.